thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's very, very, uh, very honored to be here today to talk to you guys. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what I've been through with the Bureau of Prisons. You know, I was sitting in your seats many, many years ago. I don't want to give up my age, but it's been uh, probably 35 years ago. I was sitting right there thinking to myself, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my career? Where am I going to go? Um, and at the time, when I was going to college, I was working for a, a little diesel factory. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, Shide Diesel. Anybody heard of that? Yeah, they have a little thing called Diesel Fest every year. Uh, I was working for him, and uh, I put in an application at the prison and uh, thought, you know, we'll give it a whirl. Well, they called me for an interview, went through the interview process. A few weeks later, they called me back and said, hey, we want to offer you a job. And I said, hmm, I don't know. That sounds dangerous, working in a prison. Who does that? But uh, after a lot of thought and a lot of consideration, I said, sure, you know, we'll give it a whirl. We'll see what, it, see what it's like. And I didn't realize at the time what an amazing decision I made. So I hired on with the Bureau of Prisons January 1st, 1989. And I hired in as an officer. I went to Indiana State, not as a criminal justice major, but as a computer guy, uh, management information systems. So for me, working around prisoners uh, sounded a little scary. Never been in the military, uh, never, never dealt with the criminal aspect, didn't really know what I was doing. And I hired on with the Bureau of Prisons, was an officer for a year, and then an amazing thing happened. They started hiring all these computer guys. So I was able to transfer to Oakdale, Louisiana. Uh, I'm sorry, Lexington, Kentucky first. Uh, after I've been in, in corrections for a year in Terre Haute. So I hired on at Lexington, was there for a couple years, then went to Oakdale, Louisiana. Then I was able to activate a brand new prison as a computer guy in Pekin, Illinois. Anybody ever heard of Pekin? All right, we've got a, a rival Missouri Valley Conference uh, college up there, Bradley, right? So I was able to hire in uh, as a computer guy and activate brand new facility, no inmates, start from scratch in Pekin, Illinois. Then I thought, you know, maybe the Bureau has a little more to offer than computers. So then I thought, maybe I want to break out of computers and get into some kind of upper level management or do something different. So I took a job in our central office. Anybody have any idea where our central office might be located for the Bureau of Prisons? Where would you guess? Government agency. Nope. Washington, D.C. Now, keep in mind, I'm just a poor, dumb country boy. Was raised in Terre Haute, Indiana. Had three cornfields on the side of me and a dirt road in front. Washington, D.C. was an eye-opening experience, to say the least. Okay? Wasn't used to the hustle and bustle. A lot of folks, a lot of, a lot of people. But I gained a, a wealth of information working in central office. Um, got to see our nation's capital. Amazing. If you ever have a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. It's an awesome place to visit. From Washington, D.C., I was uh, able to, to transfer them to Kansas City in our regional office. And I, I got back into computers just for a moment uh, as a regional computer administrator. And from there, I spent two years, and then I was promoted out to an associate warden at Milan, Michigan. I was an AW in three different locations. I was an associate warden in Milan, Michigan, Marion, Illinois, uh, and Springfield, Missouri. Now, anybody have any idea what Marion, Illinois is like? The prison in Marion. Well, what's, what's it, what's it kind of known for? Um, John Gotti. Okay, John Gotti was there, absolutely. What kind of a prison was Marion back in the day? It was a USP. It was a USP. It was a maximum security. It was the end of the line. And we'll talk about that here in my presentation in just a second. So I was able to work at a United States Penitentiary maximum security facility. Then I transferred to Springfield, Missouri, which is a, a hospital for inmates. Pretty amazing. It's down the Ozarks. Pretty cool. Again, another Missouri Valley Conference, uh, Missouri State 
is down that part of the country. Then from Springfield, I was able to transfer, I was able to promote to Warden. And I went to Duluth, Minnesota. Anybody ever heard of that? All right, if you go, go during the summertime, not in the winter. All right, winters are pretty rough in Duluth, Minnesota. I was warden there for about 14 months, and then I, I moved out to uh, Pennsylvania, to a place called Schuylkill, Pennsylvania, Schuylkill County. Then I went back to Pekin, amazingly enough, I activated it back in the early days, went back as warden, and this job at Terre Haute came open, and I've been here since March of 2017. So that kind of gives you a snapshot of my career. Now, if you're keeping track, that's a total of 13 duty stations in 29 years. All right, that tells you one thing. It's a hard for me to hold down a job, okay? So every two years, I'm usually moving. But uh, I want to give you a little snapshot of what we do in the Bureau of Prisons, what we're about. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, kind of what, what we do as an agency. Movies, what do you got? Yes, ma'am. Shawshank Redemption. I get that a lot. What else you got? Longest Yard. Longest Yard. Okay, so let me pause. So the two movies they picked out portray corrupt wardens, right? All right, not the case here, I guarantee you. All right, I don't know why Hollywood always portrays corrupt wardens. What else you got? Green Mile. Green Mile, awesome movie. What else? How many wardens of the new black fans do we have? All right. Let me put this in perspective. Everything you see on TV, keep in mind, it is Hollywood. All right. There may be a sliver of truth, but the majority of it is for your entertainment. All great movies, by the way. But I want to talk about the Bureau of Prisons. What do we do? What do you think the most important thing we do as an agency? What do you want us to do? You guys live in our community. What do you want us to do? Any ideas? Yes, sir. Rehabilitate, help reintroduce criminals to the greater society. That's awesome. Have you been reading our website? No. That's a textbook answer. That's good. That's good. What else you got? That's part of it. Yes, sir. Bingo. You guys are good. You guys have studied up. So let me talk about our mission. Our mission is threefold. First and foremost, our job is to protect society. That's the number one thing we do. We keep the bad guys in, and we protect society. We got to make sure that we keep uh, the general public safe from these guys that are incarcerated. Secondly, our job is to confine offenders in an environment which is controlled, safe, humane, cost efficient, and appropriately secure. And we'll, we'll kind of drill down into that and talk about what I mean by appropriately secure. And lastly, which is what this young man over here said, is really to provide work and other self-improvement opportunities uh, to assist offenders in becoming law-abiding citizens. Where do inmates go when they're released? Anybody ever thought about that? Where do they go? Yes, ma'am. Okay, after the halfway house. That's a good answer. Where, where do they go after the halfway house? Okay, where do a lot of them, where, where are their communities? You think they go back to Terre Haute? Some, absolutely. So do you want people that are going back to Terre Haute that are ready to reenter society? Or would you rather us just warehouse them and when it's time for them to release, release them back? Because if we don't, provide reentry opportunities, they're probably going to go back to the same crime-ridden environment that they came from. In other words, they're going to go out, hustle drugs on the street, they're probably going to be doing criminal activities, they're going to participate in violence, and that's not what we want. We want to make sure the inmates are ready to go back to society and that we've offered them the opportunities. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into that too, and how we offer opportunities, because there's a lot. All right, let's go back a little bit here. So the Federal Bureau of Prisons, <clears throat> here's what we look like. 
We've got one central office, which we talked about, that's located in Washington, D.C. We've got six regional offices. So we are in the north central region in Terre Haute. So that means my boss is in Kansas City. We've got two staff training facilities. We've got approximately 40,000 employees nationwide. 122 federal facilities. Anybody know how many federal prisons there are in the state of Indiana? Anybody want to guess? Nope. Just one. Terre Haute. Actually, if you want to get nitty gritty, there's three because we've got three in our complex. There's a FCI, a USP, and a camp. But there's only one location in Indiana, and that's in Terre Haute. Illinois, anybody have any idea how many is in Illinois? There's a few more in Illinois. We've got Marion, Greenville, Illinois, Chicago, and Thompson. Four. Am I missing one? So we've got 122 facilities, 26 residential reentry centers. What is, just for your knowledge, a residential reentry center, does anybody have any idea what that is? Somebody mentioned it over here. When inmates get out, where do they go? It's a halfway house, right? You've all heard of a halfway house, right? It's where an inmate gets more freedom and they're allowed to participate in more community activities, try to find a job, kind of get them on their feet. So they go to a halfway house. In total inmate population, we're right around 186,000 inmates nationwide. A lot of inmates we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So here's kind of a population tracking that I showed you. This is back in the 1980s, and notice it keeps growing, 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 until we get to about 2011. What happens? It starts going down. What happened in 2011? Anybody keep up with the news? What did the president start doing? It was on the news almost every day, or at least once every three months. Anybody have any idea? He started pardoning inmates. He started doing clemencies. He started allowing inmates that were serving life sentences or longer sentences. He looked at them for the nonviolent criminals and said, you know what? Maybe they got too much time, so let's reduce their sentence. So from 2011 till today, you've noticed a decline in our population by nearly 32,000 inmates. That's quite a bit. All right, so our mission statement. Going back to the first part is to protect society. The second part of our mission statement is to confine offenders which is in an environment which is controlled, safe, humane, cost efficient and appropriately secure. Now, why do we care whether it's cost efficient? Who pays for the inmates? Food, medical costs? Taxpayers. Do you all pay taxes? Yes. Yeah, so you're all paying for their incarceration. All right? So wouldn't you much rather have an environment that the inmates pay their penance to society, pay their debt, get out, and become a law-abiding citizen and don't come back. Because they're a burden on society to begin with, because the taxpayers are paying for their incarceration. Um, institution security levels. We have five different security levels in the Bureau of Prisons. And those security levels are really determined by a number of factors. And I've listed those up here. Mobile patrol. How many trucks we have driving around? Internal security. How many grills? How many doors? How many locks do we have? Towers. Do we man the towers? You ever see a gun tower? You drive by prisons, you see these big towers around the fence? There's usually one or two people up there in the tower keeping a vigilant eye around the fence line. What do you think we house up there in those towers? Okay, what else? What are you going to do if somebody's heading towards the fence line? What do you think we're going to do? We're going to shoot them. Well, what's our number one mission statement? What was number one, I told you? Protect society. Okay? So inmates know that. Those towers, they're, they're housed with uh, lethal munitions. Uh, 
Of course, before we get there, there's a, a number of things that we do as far as warnings, but there are lethal munitions in the towers. Uh, another thing that determines the type of security is the type of inmate that's housed. Now, do you think we house a guy that cheated on his taxes for five years in the same location that we're going to house a kingpin drug dealer that's killed numerous people? Probably not, okay? There's a difference in, in uh, inmate. Perimeter barriers are another one. Inmate to staff ratio, detection devices, and any other special mission. Now, I mentioned I worked at Springfield, which is a medical center. That's a pretty unique and special mission. We only deal with sick inmates, whether it's physically sick or mentally sick at Springfield. So how do we classify inmates? There's a whole list of things. Uh, depending on their background, depending on their family, depending on where they came from, their history of violence, the crime they committed, uh, based on their history during their incarcerated, incarceration, there's a number of factors that we look at to determine where an inmate house, where, where we house an inmate. The inmates program needs. You think all inmates that come through our system are all mentally there? You think they're all? We deal with a lot of psych patients. We, we deal with a lot of psych inmates that have mental issues. They've been abused growing up. They've got a lot of uh, family history. Um, so we have to put them in an environment where we have programs that can help those inmates out. So again, that all depends on the inmate classification. So, at Terre Haute, we have three different institutions. We've got a United States Penitentiary, high security. We've got an FCI, Federal Correctional Institution, medium security. And we've also got a minimum security camp, FPC, Federal Prison Camp. What's unique about that prison camp? Does anybody know? Has anybody been out there? No fences, okay? So, you know, I always tell the inmates, with freedom comes responsibility. The more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have. And that's kind of the same for all of us, right? I mean, as you come up in age, you graduate from high school, you get in college, you get a little more freedom, right? But you also have to maintain that freedom with responsibility. I mean, you can't come to college and party 24-7 around the clock, right? Does that apply to everyone? Or just some? No? We all? Okay. So I tell the inmates with freedom comes responsibility, meaning if they're in a camp, they have to act and be responsible. Now, can they go over to the Dollar General store right across the street and buy alcohol? Could they? They have that freedom. Now, what happens if they get caught? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Send them to a higher security. There you go. So there's consequences. You're going to probably end up going to a higher security level where there's a fence, there's controlled movements, there's all those sort of things. So again, at the minimum security camp, uh, the inmates have no convictions for violent crimes. In other words, more white-collar type criminals, okay? Tax guys, minimal drugs. Uh, what about sex offenders? No, not at all. So they can't have any public safety factors such as sex offenders. And here's the kicker. The inmates have to have less than 10 years left on their sentence in order to go to a camp. If they've got 11 years, they don't qualify for a camp. So we screen these guys and put them in the appropriately secure facility. Uh, they've got to participate in programs and stay out of trouble, basically. Now, for a medium, security inmate. There's a lot that has to happen too. Um, these guys often have past convictions or history of violence. So if you go from a camp to a medium, you're going up two security levels. Because we go minimum, low, then a medium. So most of these guys have some sort of history of violence. They've got usually longer sentences. They've got extensive criminal background. And they're most likely to have a history of violating the rules and regulations inside the institution. So again, inmates, the system is designed, the inmate can work their way up or work their way down in the system. So if an inmate comes in at a medium, he can literally work his way down to a camp. Likewise, if a guy's at my camp, 
he can work his way all the way up to a high security at penitentiary. So the system's designed to flex. High security. Those are the guys at the penitentiary. Um, these guys have extensive past violence, were convicted of crimes considering moderate high, uh, acts of greatest severity, usually a lot longer sentences, possible escape history. They've attempted an escape. We have programs in our prison. If a guy attempts escape from a secure facility, we'll put him on what we call a two hour watch, which means he's got to check in with a staff member every two hours so we know where he's at. Um, a lot of these guys are younger, a lot of life sentence inmates, uh, and, and again, they've, they've violated the rules and regulations inside our, our prisons. So let's talk a little bit about demographics. What kind of things are we looking at? Um, in 19, the first 10 years the Bureau existed, from 1930 to 1940, we doubled in size. We went from 14,000 inmates. 24,000 inmates. We went from 14 facilities to 24 facilities. Today we have, what I say, 186,000 inmates and 122 institutions. So we've grown by leaps and bounds. I've indicated up here the levels of security that we have. Administrative, we've got one administrative maximum security facilities. Anybody know where that's located in the Federal Bureau of Prisons? We have one nationwide. You might know where it's at. Those guys are locked down like 23 hours a day. It is in Colorado. You know where in Colorado? Inglewood. Close. We've got an institution in Inglewood, but that's not it. It's right down the road from Inglewood. It's in Florence, Colorado. We used to have two when Marion was, was operated as maximum security. We had two, two max securities. We, we now only have one. Um, we've got 17 high facilities, 47 medium, 7 lows, and 48 minimums. So that's kind of a breakdown of our security systems nationwide. There's kind of a snapshot of Terre Haute. How many inmates do you think we've got nation, uh, at Terre Haute? How many inmates do you think we deal with on a complex? Any idea, any guess how many we've got between all three facilities? Yes, sir? 34,000, that's a lot, that's a lot of inmates. Not quite that many. How many? Just at, just at Terre Haute, how many do we have? How many? 10,000, that's still a lot. Yes, sir? About 5,000. 5,000? Here you go, I'll help you out. 2,600. 2,600. And that's split between three facilities. So at the pen, We've got 1,378. At the FCI, we've got 905. At the camp, we've only got 338. Now, what do we use that camp for mainly? What do you think? We, as in administration, what do you think I use that camp for? What do, what do I use those camp inmates for? You see all this ground out here surrounding that? Somebody's got to cut the grass, right? Somebody's got to shovel the snow. Somebody's got to do all the maintenance. So we use those campers to, to be worker bees around the facility uh, to get all that stuff done. But it's kind of a win-win because remember I told you that we concentrate on reentry efforts? Well, we're really teaching inmates a job skill when they're going out and learning how to wire a building with electric or run phone line or construct a building in the construction shop. Or work on vehicles, so they're always learning a trade. Let's talk about why they're in. What kind of crimes do they commit? Well, I kind of broke this down between the USP, the FCI, and the camp. What do you think the majority of the inmates are in jail for? What would you say? Drugs, right? What do you think the hardest type of criminal is to manage from my standpoint. Remember, I am responsible for keeping the inmates safe as well. Who is it? Sex offenders. Sex offenders.
very, very difficult, okay? Because believe it or not, inmates have a code as well. And a lot of inmates don't want to be housed with sex offenders. They try to drive them off the yard. They threaten them. They try to assault them, whatever. So it makes our job a little more difficult. Um, youngest and oldest inmate. Inmates range from age 20 in almost every facility all the way up to early 80s. All right, 83 year old inmate in penitentiary. You think that's rough? Because he's running around with a lot of, what, 25, 26, 28 year olds. Um, average age of the offender between the three institutions are about the same, 40 to mid 40s. But you can see kind of a breakdown of, of um, the only highlight is the camp. You'll see fraud, bribery, extortion. Majority of those are at the camp, 20-some 20, 20 percent is what kind of crimes they're committing. How about the sentence length? Now, I put these up in months, not years. And I told you at a camp, you have to have how, less than how many years left on your sentence to go to camp? Yeah. Ten years, okay? So you see the USP, those guys are doing almost 20, 22 percent of my inmates are doing more than 20 years. 20 years left on our sentence. The camp, um, obviously you see a lot of those are 20, 27, 26, 6. Um, and then the FCI is 28% is, is at 60 to 119 months left. Kind of the population breakdown, I just uh, did the, obviously the majority of my inmates are US citizens. We've got a few from Mexico and 2% are from other countries. Staffing. How many staff do you think it takes to run all three facilities? Now, do we close at Christmas? Do we close at Thanksgiving? How about at midnight? Can we just hang a close sign on the door and say we're closed? So we're 365 days a year, 24 hours around the clock. Now, when I say staffing, I'm talking about all different types of staffing. I've got correctional officers, I've got nurses, I've got doctors, I've got attorneys, I've got carpenters, dentists, accountants, human resource specialists, case managers, facilities, workers. How many staff do you think it takes to run that facility? How many? 7,000 staff? I like the way you think. I'd love to have 7,000 staff. That would be awesome. A little bit less. Yes, sir? A thousand or less? It's a pretty good guess. Yeah. We're right around there, but we're a little less. We've got 825 authorized positions. Now, key word is authorized. Do you think I'm allowed to fill 825 positions? No. I have to keep a few open for what they call salary savings to make that up because we only get funded at, let's say, 90% of our staff. So right now, we're running, my staff complement as of today is 717 staff on board. So there's a lot of vacant positions. Now in a big department, you probably wouldn't notice that. Let's say Correctional Services has 300 staff in that department. Well, if I was four vacancies, you probably wouldn't notice it. However, if you're in a shop like Computer Services and you've got five staff and you're four staff short, you're going to notice that. So again, depending on what department you're in, you'll notice those. Here's kind of the way it breaks down. 392 staff in custody. When I talk about custody staff, what am I talking about? See, correctional officers, right? Hey, let me, let me see a show of hands. How many, folk, how many people know somebody that work at the prison? Oh, wow. So you guys are pretty educated. How many family works at the... All right, so you guys are very educated. All right, good. Twelve drug treatment specialists. We have a drug treatment program at the camp. It's called... Uh, it's really the only evidence, true evidence-based reentry program we have in the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, it's about an 18-month course. Inmates can get up to a year off their sentence going through RDAP. Now, I'll say this. 
If you were locked up and you had to do 10 years and somebody says, go through this program, you'll get a year off. Would anybody say no? No, you're going to want a year off your sentence, right? So I'm not naive when we offer that program. I know inmates are really after that year. But my hope is this is a group treatment program. My hope is that inmates change here and in here. Because that's really what it takes for reentry. The inmate has to be willing to change. He has to be willing to understand that criminal thinking needs to uh, take a back seat, concentrate on giving back to the community, those sort of things. So I got 12 drug treatment staff, one public health, I'm sorry, seven public health, and 323 support staff. Now, 323 is just really everything else that I mentioned. The doctors, the attorneys, the carpenters, the welders, the accountants, everything else. 54 contract staff. That's not part of my authorized complement. And here's kind of the way the org chart looks. So you have one complex warden over the entire complex. All right? Fortunately, that's me. I'm very blessed. Um, got great staff. I'm very fortunate to have that position. I have a warden, Jesse Bell. He's the warden at the FCI, the Federal Correctional Institution. He has an associate warden and a camp administrator that works for him. Underneath me, I have two associate wardens, an executive assistant, and a supervisory attorney. That's kind of how the exec staff look of the whole complex. Departments. Now, if you're thinking about a job in corrections, people really don't think about food service workers working in the jail, right? Food service is probably one of my most important departments. Why is that? You gotta feed them, right? My food service guy can't come in and say, hey, Warden, today we ran out of food. We can't feed the inmates. That's not an option. Okay? <clears throat> food service is one area. If you're gonna have problems in prison, you'll have because if the food's bad, the inmates are gonna let you know. So, again, food service is not a five day a week job. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Each one of these boxes up here represent a different department. So if you're thinking about corrections, I don't want you to think about, man, I gotta be a correctional officer and I gotta babysit inmates all day long. It's really much, much more than that. It's bigger than that. You know, I hired in as a correctional officer. But you know what? I eventually went over to I eventually got into computer services, information technology, um, and eventually become a department head and work my way up. Every one of these is led by a department head. So there's a lot of different areas that you can branch out in uh, the Department of Justice. All right, some fun facts. Let's, let's play fun facts. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Let me rush through these because I want to allow some time for question and answer. Inmates have email. That's something relatively new. Okay? They do have email. They pay for email. But they have email. Oops. Did you guys cheat? How many emails do you think were sent out by inmates last year? You are a genius. That's awesome. 2,106,957. What do you think it costs an inmate to send an email? Now, let me ask you guys this. Do you pay for every email that you send out? No. You guys probably don't even send email anymore, right? Am I talking to the wrong crowd here? You do? You do send email? Okay. I just thought you guys text and Facebook and all that stuff. I don't know. So, how much do you think it costs an inmate? A dollar for every email? Five cents. Five cents? Good guess. So an inmate's charged five cents a minute, okay, to send as, any, as many emails as he wants. It can be one, depends on how quick he types, right? So the poor guy that's sitting there hunting <laughs> packets is going to cost him a lot more to send emails, right? Phone calls. Any guesses on how much they cost? 
So inmates have to pay to call out. Okay, how much do you think they charge? It breaks down to about over 90 cents a minute. 90 cents a minute? It's a little high. Any other guesses? 50 cents a minute. 50 cents? Six cents a minute for local calls. All right, you guys pay for local calls? You guys have home phones or just cell phones? You don't have home phones anymore, right? That's a thing of the past. You just have cell phones, right? Long distance, 23 cents a minute, and if you're gonna call international, it's a buck a minute, or 99 cents, okay? What are the most popular commissary items? So inmates are allowed to shop. Inmates go down to the commissary, they work, all right? We pay inmates to work, starting out at about 11 cents an hour. Anybody want to work for 11 cents an hour in here? All right. What do you think the most popular commissary items are? No smoking in jail. No tobacco products. That's contraband. All right. Yes, sir. Chips. Good. Good guess. Ramen noodles. Funny you said, did I flip it up or did you cheat? You didn't cheat? All right. Ramen noodles. And this is how many packages of ramen noodles we, we uh, sold last year, just in Terre Haute. Soda and chips are, are, for, are next. One other thing that I didn't throw up here that I, th I find very odd, you know another high, high uh, purchase sought after commissary items is mackerel. All right, believe it or not. They use it actually as, as some of them use it as, um, Money, okay? If you want to place a bet, we'll bet five cans of mackerel. Whatever reason, I, I don't know. I don't eat mackerel. How many pounds of laundry do you think we wash each year at Terre Haute? Any guess? We do all the inmates' laundry. They don't have their own washers or dryers. We do it all. Any guesses? How many? 3,000? How about 2.2 million pounds of laundry? Each year. Alright? Alright, I want to. Part three of our mission statement is really re entry. It's really to provide work and self, other self improvement opportunities for offenders to become law abiding citizens. So, how do we do that? We have education, we have school. Inmates can go to school. Matter of fact, we require them to get a GED if they don't already have one. It's mandatory. If they don't get a GED, um, we'll put them in and refuse. And, there's all kinds of sanctions for that, uh, how much money they could get. There's also all these programming that we do, whether it's mental health, religious services, sex abuse treatment, uh, substance abuse, a lot of programming going on. <coughs> Typical day of an inmate. They get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, we go feed them breakfast. We have work call. Every inmate has to have a job. Again, starting out at 11 cents an hour, now they can work up, I think it's like a buck 10 uh, is the highest we pay them. Uh, at 11 o'clock, we call mainline. 12 o'clock, we have work call. They can either go to education, psychology. At 4 o'clock in the evening, we count. That's a mandatory stand-up count. Every inmate has to be standing when we go by their cell. They're locked down, locked in their cell for count. We count again at 9 o'clock, and we count at 12, 3, 5, 4, 9 o'clock p.m. on weekends and holidays, we count at 10. So we do a lot of counting, all right? Again, going back to our number one thing on our mission statement is to protect society. This is, kind of falls into that. Talking about education programs, I'm going to skip through some of this because I want to show you some pictures here uh, of contraband. Talking about religious services groups, the majority of our inmates are Protestant. Uh, however, only about 25 to 35% of my inmates participate in religious service programs. We actually, at Terre Haute, have the only faith-based program in a penitentiary nationwide. Uh, and that's our Life Connections program. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this because I'm running out. We do release uh, preparation planning to make sure the inmates get... Uh, the necessary information they need to re-enter society. So the next couple of minutes, and I want to go through these pretty quick because I want questions and answers. Um, here's examples of prison contraband. 
Now, before I start, what is the definition of contraband in prison? Anything unauthorized. All right, so here we go. Homemade weapons, they exist, they're real. What do you find on a lot of those homemade weapons? What do you see? Melted plywood. What else do you see? What else? Rope. What kind of rope? What are they using the rope for? Yeah, they don't want to lose it. All right. If you go to a fight with a shank, the last thing you want to do is lose that. So you find out a lot. More homemade weapons. This down here was actually taken out of USP Marion. Anybody have any idea what that was made of? What is it? Nope. We have saran wrap on the inmates' meals that we sent in. Over a period of six months, the inmate kept taking that saran wrap and heating it up and melting it down. Ended up making a shank out of saran wrap. More homemade weapons. What's the most dangerous, do you think, kind of weapon that we have inside our prisons? What is it made of? Most dangerous? Plastic, why? Okay. What, what, are the, what do you think the inmates walk through all day long? Metal detectors. Metal detectors won't detect plastic. Homemade intoxicants. Probably one of the most dangerous types of contraband I have is homemade intoxicants. Yes? This brown bag? Which one? Um, it's probably things they've stolen out of food service to make the, the intoxicants. Sugar, potatoes, yeast. Yep. All right, keep moving along here. Intoxicants. Heroin. It's real. They smuggle it in. They get it in somehow, some way. Black tar heroin. Suboxone. Anybody heard of Suboxone? All right, synthetic drugs are the new drug of choice of inmates nowadays. Very hard to detect, very easy to get in. Fentanyl patches, synthetic drugs, very hard to detect. Unless you're looking for a wet piece of cardboard, you're not going to notice this when it comes through the, the mail room. A lot of stolen food. That's out of, con that's out of food service. Tattoo paraphernalia. Stamps is actually used as inmate currency. Gambling paraphernalia. Our medication we control, but a lot of them are self-carry, but uh, they abuse that too. Marijuana. Homemade pipes. Tobacco. Tobacco is contraband inside a prison. A lot of cell phones. At the camp, more so than anywhere else. They hide them in ditches, they go get them. Uh, lots and lots of cell phones. Modified tools. This is all contraband that was found at a camp in a ditch in a black bag. They got vodka. They don't need to make hooch at the camp, they go get the real stuff because there's no fence around it again, less security. More synthetic drugs. This is probably a, this is a pretty gross slide. Um, inmates have actually swallowed these balloons and we've actually put them on a dry cell status. During a visit, they'll get potato chips, try to swallow the balloons, and these actually came out of an inmate. Uh, we recovered a lot of K2. This was in a paint can, an inmate was carrying it across the compound. It was a, a shank hidden in the, Paint. Lots of ways they conceal it. This is coffee creamer. Uh, this is some sort of uh, gel they put on their hair. They modify Coke cans. They modify for concealment. All right. Oh, let me right here. 
right here. This is an x-ray that we've actually taken of an inmate that we found something inside of their body. Real quick, I want to talk about salary. I know you guys have got to go. If you start out as a correctional officer, you're probably going to be starting out at $40,500 a year. Registered nurse starts out at $56,000, goes all the way up to $73,000. Psychologist, $60,000. Lieutenant, that's the first supervisory level, starts out about $54,000 a year. If you're interested, usajobs.gov is where you go for employment. Thank you all.